And I think when you're a small business or you're a young, ambitious person, that ambition can really easily turn into fear because you know, of the things that you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a slippery slope. And that's this thing where I see, like, there's nothing worse than a cynical 25-year-old in New York. Like, that's brutal. Like, nobody wants to be around you. <laughs> nobody. Like, and, and everyone will run away. But if you're the 25-year-old that's asking a million questions with a smile on your fucking face, like, you're going to go any way you want. Yeah. That's a piece of advice. That's great so advice. Try to try to shake that shit off. Because it's easy to go there. Yeah. It's easy to get beaten down by this place. Um, if you're that person with a big smile on your face asking a lot of questions, there's a lot more people that are going to be willing to help you. Yeah. That's Chris Gentile, creator and owner of Pilgrim Surf and Supply, a surf and apparel shop in Brooklyn, New York. Chris is a surfing enthusiast, a visual artist, and a filmmaker who has combined his creative interests and love of the ocean to create a unique lifestyle for himself, which we discuss in this episode. Also, later in the show, Chris mentions a surf film he's working on. That film is titled Self-Discovery for Social Survival and will premiere this summer with a full-length soundtrack to follow in the fall. Speaking of soundtracks, many thanks to Keith and Gil at Mexican Summer, a Brooklyn record label, for allowing us to use some of the great music you'll hear in this episode. And thanks, of course, to the artists, tracks from Jeffrey Cantu Ledesma, as well as songs off of Dunyan and Woods' collaborative album, Myths 003. I'll include links on the site so you can listen in greater depth to that music. And of course, thanks to the co-creators of this show, Aaron Mason with Sound Design and C.F. Watkins for the visual artwork. Here we go. Let's hear it for Chris Gentile of Pilgrim Surf and Supply. Came from a pretty humble um, upbringing. You know, my, my mom was a secretary, um, had me when she was pretty young, but um, I had a, uh, two wonderful grandparents that, that helped raise me. And uh, my grandfather worked in, a, in the Narragansett Brewery in Rhode Island oh, yeah. pretty much his whole life. And my grandmother was a seamstress um, and, uh, and, a, and a homemaker. It's like she was this figure that could do anything when I was a kid. Like she could. She had a crazy garden. Like she could grow food. She made the most amazing food. She made my clothes. She like you know made me feel better when I got when I got hurt. You know, yeah. uh, kind of saw her as this like uh, magician. And I you know until I got older, I, I didn't really understand that. I couldn't. I remember having this moment where I like, oh my god, like this woman is like phenomenal. You know, mm. and she was like just so ins insanely talented at doing these things and so passionate about it. It was like her, her pleasure, her joy was to like make people food. Yeah. Uh, she'd make penne by hand. Like, holy shit, who does that? <laughs> you know, that's incredible. So, um, you know, my grandfather was a, um, you know, kind of um, dabbler and, in, in, you know, like woodworker and um, uh, my uncle as well, my uncle just like when he was a kid would just tear apart like transistor radios and put them back together again and make them work, you know, that kind of stuff. So I always just had a, a penchant for making things. I mm -hmm. just wanted to draw and wanted to <laughs> build things. Um, when I got into skateboarding, I think that was probably one of the first moments where uh, I was creating objects like at scale, you know, and, yeah. um, and building ramps and uh, trying to figure out how to. Um, how to do that, you know, with my friends with like, you know, a JC Penny jigsaw and, <laughs> you know, and like the rudimentary tools and stealing wood and all that kind of stuff. Like, um, you know, and being introduced to like punk rock and, uh, you know, these like underbelly cultures like that, th that happened to me pretty, pretty early on, you know, like age 10, you know, 9, 10, 11. Um, and I was totally hooked, you know, enamored by it. Like, what were some of the specific influences of that culture? Um, I mean, you know, in the skate realm, it was the, the early, like, early Bones Brigade videos, um, very, you know, the very first one, obviously. Uh, I was, like, of age, you know, I'm 44, so um, I, I saw, like, VHS, uh, you know, technology come into the world, you know, and, um, you know, when that happened, it, that, that's when the, 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 skate, the skate tape started happening, you know, like Streets of Fire and Skateboard Madness, um, you know, Bones Brigade. Um, and, you know, we would get these videos from our local skate shop, rent them or whatever, and then we'd go home and, like, 
we watch them over and over and over again. And then you go out and like you try to do like Lance Mountain's move and you try to do Tommy Guerrero's move. And you try to do you know, and you just go back and study what they did. And you go back outside and did it. And you put the sticker on your board the way they put the sticker on your board. And you know, like you had the, the the color rails they had. And, and then but then like it it really was like a. Uh, a supportive kind of culture, you know. Everybody really supported one another. You did a trick and you landed it, and people were stoked for you. You know. <laughs> you know? And as a kid, you know, um, I never related to uh, team sports yeah. like football or you know, I, uh, ba- baseball. None of that. Like I, I just I, I couldn't assimilate to it. And, and then embedded in that, you know, I was going to like you know all ages shows as a young kid. Um, my mom was young. She let me go do those things without really knowing like who the meat men were and like. We're the meat men. You suck! This is our jam and dance song. Let's go! Oh. Robotics. Robotics. I love robotics. All these insane acts that were, you know, exposing me to some dark adult secrets. <laughs> yeah, but, um, but it was all, you know, very healthy and fun. Um, yeah. But this uh, is all in Rhode Island? Uh, that was, yeah, that was in Rhode Island, yeah. Um, and then uh, when I was about, like, I, almost 13 years old, my mother moved me to uh, South Florida, um, which was a shocker. Yeah. And, but the um, positive thing was it was a development boom, so there's lots of places to steal wood and make ramps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I started surfing too, like, you know, around that time. Um, my uncle and his gaggle of friends were some of the first guys to surf in Rhode Island in the like, early 60s. And, um, you know, they were a uh, big influence on me uh, as, a, as a kid. I would say that, that that those moments in my life, and I would even say that like skateboarding, I, um, as I've gotten older and gotten to know people in the industry, I've been fortunate to like meet some of my heroes, like like Lance and um, Rodney Mullen and uh, Nautis Coppice and some of these guys who are not that much older than me, but mm-hmm. you know, they're they're my heroes and uh, Glenn Freeman, you know, people like that, uh, and I've gotten to like thank them and. I kind of realized at a certain point that those guys really, you know, they weren't trying to do this, but they inspired a, uh, an entire generation of creatives um, and in a, in a way that I think uh, uh, nothing else really has in our, in our time. You know, it's like no, no other little weird kind of subculture. You know, maybe, maybe you could say that about some movements in music, but um, I think it's super unique. and. Um, those guys weren't trying to do any of that, you know, it was just, uh, what, a, what an incredible time. My, my mother, at one point, was uh, talking to me about, like, I'm trying to remember the context of it, but we were near a ramp somewhere, and she was listening, we were, like, watching these kids skate, and we were just back and forth on a little half pipe and she like she kind of got all like teared up and she goes you know that's what I remember so like vividly about when you and when you were a kid and all you your friends would be outside like skating the ramp and I'd be upstairs and I would hear that sound and it just made me feel good and I knew you were safe you know yeah I told I told Lance that story and the guy like got he got welled up like he was like you know he, I mean I told him in more detail like kind of you know, like how much of an influence he is on, on me and like our shop and um, and I, yeah those guys are I mean all of them not us is the same way you know they're, they're hyper creative and um, you know have such incredible influence but they're all I mean yeah they're all they're all just rad guys <laughs> Surfing was in a weird place in the 90s, I think, and, you know, it was, we're suffering from what, like, a lot of people refer to as the Spicoli effect, where, you know, surfers are looked at as sort of, like, deadbeat, mm. kind of stoner, um, degenerates, you know, anti-intellectual morons, you know, um, which, you know, there's that, there's that side of it, <laughs> which just, people that are just obsessed with surfing just want to surf and yeah. um, will skip out on anything to go surf. And, uh, it, it was uh, something that I felt that I didn't really want people to know about. I didn't want them, them people to know that about me, yeah, that yeah. I was a surfer, you know, oh, wow. or that I skated. 
um, I just wanted to do those things and then, but you know, somehow like I wanted to be like, you know, academically like respected yeah, and like, yeah. you know, be, be professional or be, you know, be, you know, be an artist. Because of um, that kind of popular assumption about, yeah, about that world. Totally. Um, it was weird. It was something I just felt, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, what's, you know what, what, what felt really good to me was that I had that validated by, um, uh, by uh, Bill Finnegan, by William Finnegan, when, um, you know, uh, he, was, he did like a, a reading at our shop a couple years ago in Barbarian Days, oh, the, book, yeah. the, the memoir he, he came out with. Um, uh, and he said to someone in the crowd, he's like, yeah, uh, for a very long time I was a closet surfer. <laughs> and I went, wow, you know, holy shit, like I was the same way, you know. <laughs> Um, and yeah, for a moment in time, like I didn't really um, care for anyone to know that about me. Yeah. You know, I kind of wanted to keep those things separate, mm -hmm. uh, keep these like different parts of my life separate. And then um, I had Dave Hickey, um, which was an incredible moment for me. Um, he probably doesn't remember it at all, but <laughs> he's this amazing, you know, um, art critic, writer. Like I would even call him a sociologist. Um, and he had just written this book called Air Guitar when I was in grad school, and he came into my studio, and he, um, uh, as, a, as the visiting artist does, and uh, to sit down and kind of like talk to me about my work or evaluate my work. And um, he came in, the first thing he said is like, I'm not gonna talk to you about your work. I don't know you from Adam, and I'm not gonna fucking get into your head. Like, yeah. all, he's like, you got all these other academic, you know, like faculty here that are gonna fuck with you. Yeah. I don't need to fuck with you. Right. But what are you into? Let's talk about what you're into. Yeah. What, what, what music do you, where are you from? Like, what, do you, what kind of music? And he's sitting there with a big, you know, like 30 ounce, like Dunkin' Donuts coffee, and yeah. he's like chain smoking cigarettes in this like big gnarly rocking chair I had in my studio in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And, I'm like, whoa, this guy's tripping, you know, he's crazy, you know, it's just, he's, he's amazing, you know, he had this, like, energy about him. He's actually he just, getting to know you. Yeah, he was, like, commanded a lot of respect, you know, but at the same time, like, he's like, let's have a conversation, I don't want to, like, I don't want to have some bullshit art banter, yeah. I don't, I hate that, you know. Tell you how to think. Yeah, exactly, and he essentially just, you know, we just had started out this conversation, and it was kind of going well, and then he looked over in the corner of the studio, and he saw some of my surfboards sticking up uh -oh. over past, like, a piece of plyo that I had. Yeah, uh-oh. <laughs> and I went, uh, and he's like, hey, what are those? Yeah. What are you doing? Uh, those, those are surf what are you doing with those surfboards? And I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> no. And uh, I'm like, oh, yeah, well, you know, I, I surf. He's like, really? You're like, what, like, wow. We're, we're, you know, he just started grilling me. Yeah. Like, what kind of boards do you ride? Like, where do you surf? And, and he knew, he kind of knew his shit. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. Like, Dave Hickey knows about surfing? Yeah. And then he goes, you know, I lived in Venice. And like, you know, I, you know, like, you know, I lived, you know, I lived amongst, you know, some, some pretty incredible artists. You know, Billy Al Begston? I'm like, no. Hmm. He's like, you don't know who that is? And I'm like, no. He's like, you know, John McCracken? I'm like, yeah, the minimalist company. He goes, yeah, you know what those, that Finnish fetish shit, you know, like, you, know that, you, know what that, you know where that comes from? And the guy just basically gave me, you know, you know what Ferris Gallery, Light and Space Movement, like, Ed Ruscha, like he just like kind of, you know, slapped me around a little bit yeah. and said, all, they're, like they're very much enamored with and influenced by like these under, underbelly cultures that come out of like custom culture in America, yeah, yeah, yeah. surfboards, hot rods, you know, these things that are uniquely American, uniquely also Californian. Yeah. Um, it was totally inspiring. And then at the end of it, he just kind of looked at me. He's like, well, where, where's surfing in your work? Like, where is this part of your life in your work? Because this <clears> looks like what is this? I'm like, well, it's really not. He goes, he goes, you got to fucking get in tune with that. You yeah. got to get in touch with that. You, That's know, great. you got to let this come into your, like, what are you, you know, what are you, like, what are you making work about? Right. You have this amazing thing that you, you, you're in your life and you're just kind of like ignoring it. Right. Like you're trying to make work that other people want you to make. Like, what are you doing? And it, it really shook me up and it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. And, um, when I finally made my way to New York, I mean, you know, I came here to pursue my art career. Mm -hmm. Um, and then some other then some other weird things came came about, and we opened up a little little surf shop to service surfers. And um, I didn't realize how many people surfed yeah. lived in New York. <laughs> exhibition in, in um, San Francisco uh, with the Gregory Lynn Gallery and um, I think it was like 2005 or 2006 um, and uh, I went over to uh, went, went to 
the, the opening. Um, and uh, I've been ordering some surfboards from a, a, a guy uh, named Manny Caro. And he was shaping boards in the in the back of this little shop called Mollusk that had just opened oh, yeah. that I you know kind of learned about. I think Mollusk was yeah it must have been 2005. I think it was the first year it was open. And um, I went over and met John McCambridge who owned Mollusk. And John and I started talking. And I said, hey, I'm, I want to open a shop up in, in in Brooklyn in my neighborhood, a little hard goods shop. And I'm like, you know. I've, I've been buying. I've been getting boards from like guys like Rich Pavel and Chris Christensen and Tyler Hadzikian and um, um, you know, some other uh, some other like kind of luminary shapers. And uh, I, my plan was to just have a stock of really beautifully shaped boards, yeah. wetsuits, ding repair, DVDs, <clears throat> books. You know, yeah. all the all the stuff that surfers that really surf would want and yeah. be exposed to, but just at a really you know modest scale. And and he was like, well, hey, why don't we why don't we like partner up and mm. like I've got the infrastructure and like let's 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 do it. Yeah. And I went, wow, I mean that's cool. I wasn't counting on it being like my my livelihood. Right. Um I had you know other I was doing other things like shooting commercially as a photographer and working um with my friend Jeffrey at Condé Nast, like doing um creative direction and some 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 uh, photograph like some work for oh. um the photo studios there. So I had other means of income to support myself and like pursue my art career but this was a side idea, yeah, and um, that's how it came about, basically. And we opened up that store, you know, like a year later. And uh, yeah, we opened up our first little shop, and it, it just kind of overnight, like, turned into like a little, like a clubhouse, like a yeah. little hub. And we would project movies against these old oil tanks across this, uh, um, fuel oil storage tanks across the street yeah. through the barbed wire, and like, yeah. you know, have cookouts with 400 people, and cops would come and you know, give people tickets for open container, and but then like you know, we got to be friends with them, and they said, hey, if it's in a cup, and we don't we don't know what it is, we're not going to ask. Yeah. And we had this really, I mean, we were getting away with murder down there, and um, you know, and having a really good time, and, and it was special, and yeah. no one would fuck with us. It was pretty neat. <laughs> so it was relatively unexpected. That, totally. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, it was just a it was something that I thought would be fun to do, and. You know, if we broke even, great. And yeah. you know, um, my friend Mike like managed the store, um, and was you know, Mike was like a brilliant writer and was just a very cerebral human being. And um, you know, it was kind of like in between jobs. And said, "Hey, man, do we want to do this? Like, you know, what do you need to survive?" And he's like, he came in and he he did a great job and like was part of kind of building that community. And um, and uh, yeah, all the people that worked there, Joe Falcone, who's a uh, great young shaper. Um, He's like, a, he's like my little brother. Like he's, he, when we were starting to do work on it, he found out about it and came over when we were working on building it out in space. And he's like, I'll work for free. Nice. I want to work with you guys so bad. Uh, you know, and he was young. I mean, he was like, I think he was like 19. And we we're like, all right, yeah, all right. Yeah. All right, guy, come on. Like, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, he became fast friends with everybody. And, you know, he's making boards. And Richard Kenvin would come over and Josh Hall and Manny Caro and like all these different shapers and people would come over and just start feeding him knowledge and um, and now he's making you know beautiful surfboards yeah. and still hangs in the shop two days a week and and so the um, and then the apparel came later and well, it seems like I've been I've been here for four years probably but I stumbled upon Pilgrim right when I got here and I've always been really interested in your work and inspired by it. Uh, it seems like it, it continues to to flourish and to expand and to and to evolve in a refreshing way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, honestly, a lot of this stuff has just fallen into my lap, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, it, you know, some people, um, I think, take that thing that falls in their lap and throws it off, and or like brushes it off, or they like kind of look at it for a while and go, oh, uh, like what is this? You what know? could this be? What yeah. could this be? And I don't know. I mean, I'm. I'm not to speak in metaphors, but I, I feel like um, you know, Pilgrim, just like the, how this whole thing started. I, you know, it just it, when the opportunities just keep rising, yeah. and there's like uh, you kind of like you know, either go through the open door, you know, or or don't. Um, mm. And I'm kind of a personality that likes to go through open doors. Sometimes, you know, um, it, I'm that that could lead to some really distracting shit <laughs> or it can be really you know like enriching yeah but i've been really fortunate to have great people um you know uh, come to the you know come to the 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 pilgrim sort of um, um 
don't know even what to call it. Like, like the, uh, the the brand, or I don't mean brand is such a weird thing. Yeah. I, I can't. I, I don't even. I don't come from the industry, so I don't. I have a hard time sometimes even thinking or speaking in the terms. But yeah. um, you know the uh, the way that you know we have evolved. Like these these two over here, like you know Becky and Matt. Um, uh, it's you know been a need based sort of like growth, not a want based mm -hmm. growth. So as the opportunities come up, you know we're like, well, we yeah. need this <laughs> um, now. Well, we better go find it. You know, um, and the cool thing is like a lot of the times like it finds us. Yeah. You know, and um, that makes me feel great because uh, I've gotten to the place where I realize like I'm not. Like Pilgrim is so many different personalities. It's not just it's not just me. Like I'm not like the omnipotent potent voice. Like yeah. the influence that like Matt and Becky have. Sure. Like you know my wife Erin. Um, you know there's a lot of different um, uh, facets. You know and um, try to try to stay awake and open enough to like let things yeah. happen. And then we have this amazing relationship with a, a Japanese partner that happened a couple years ago, and that's been you know. Um, an incredible relationship and challenging, um, but you know, in, in the best sort of ways. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, it's an incredible um, uh, exercise in communication yeah. and um, and development. You know, trying to like make things that work for really different kinds of people. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's been. It, it seems that people are drawn to kind of the feeling, the feeling of what Pilgrim represents. The product kind of speaks for itself and says more than, a, to use the term, brand ever ever could. And that's what is, uh, I'll use the word refreshing again, but that's what draws me to it. Oh, that's super generous of you to say, man. That's really nice of you to say. I mean, I don't, you know, like, perception is a funny thing. Like, you know, we perceive what we do a certain way, We just, but when you put something out into the world, just like making art, you know, you, you relinquish that control, you know, yeah. like you're no longer in charge of what, <laughs> what that perception is. Um, and the cool thing about apparel, the cool thing about you know, fashion is that people like choose to buy it and wear it. It's like, holy shit, you know, that's so intimate, you know. Yeah. Art is one thing, you know, you, someone buys your, your work and they put it on their walls and, um, you know, that's, you know, that's amazing, yep. but when someone actually puts it on their body yeah. and it becomes a part of their identity, like that to me is the ultimate. You yeah. know? Um, and uh, it shocks me still when I see someone walking down the street with like, you know, oh, I mean, a t-shirt's one thing. You're like, oh, cool, like Pilgrim t-shirt, that's right. But like when they're wearing like our cut and sew and they have like a jacket on or have like, yeah, you're wearing this shirt. <laughs> like, I'm like, I get so excited. I think, you know, Becky and I talk about it all the time. It gets us like, Gets us pumped, you know. Yeah, like we're yeah. like, oh, you know, like, like that fit them right, and they like they chose to buy that thing. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of energy that goes into making this stuff. Um, it, it's so challenging, you know. The mm. process is is a is a, I don't want to say it's hard. Um, it's it's it takes a tremendous amount of of, of patience and um, and it's just a tenacious thing to do to yeah. make. And I have so much respect for people who, any brand really, that's like trying to, uh, you know, make it work because it's, yeah. it's a complex thing. It's seasonal, it's perishable, it's, right. um, it moves really quickly. Um, but yeah, for me, like the, like the feeling thing that you, you touched on is so important to me. And that like, that, that's the part that I want to be good at all the time. Mm -hmm. you, know, um, uh, you know, to me, like coming into that store, like the actual physical retail experience uh, is so important to me. And to me, it's like you're walking into an exhibition. You know, yeah. um, you're walking, or you're walking into someone's home that's like having you over. Yeah. And you know, I want everyone, I want like everyone's senses to be tapped into, like the way the place smells, the way the place sounds, the way the place feels, the way yeah. the place looks. Like I want everything to be, you know, firing. And um, I want it to be. Uh, I want. I want to give people a promise of an experience, a yeah. good experience yeah. when they come into our store. And um, and I think. The way that I arrived at that, and I mean, it's, yeah, it, I don't, I, it wasn't like I woke up one morning and I articulated it and like, right. you know, created a map and created a, you know, a, a rollout plan yeah. and said, this is how we're going to do this. I think I got that courage, you know, from a lot of different places and, you know, just to like let things touch each other, so to speak. You mm -hmm. know, um, Andy Spade said something to me, like I've gotten to know him um, and he's a friend and I've, I've, I think I would, I would say he's a major influence on Pilgrim um, and uh, you know he I remember him saying like you know like uh, 
you know, I, I had to have the courage at some point to do what I did when to let all my passions touch. Oh, yeah. um, and I kind of heard a little bit of that from Dave Hickey too, like, you know, and oh, I remember yeah. putting it all together and going, fuck yeah, man, yeah. you know, it doesn't all have to make sense. You don't have to like, you know, yeah, right. have an analytical sort of like breakdown of like why a, a Chim Maya record and Norse Projects yeah. and a Jim Phillips Surfboard uh, relate to one another. I love that. They just do, yeah. you know, I mean, they, it, it, you, you have to use your imagination, but um, there are like things that tie those things together. So there's like craft and there's like refinement and there's like experimentation and there's all these things that yeah. those personalities will, like kind of um, you know, embody, but they don't even know about each other. Right. But I know about them and I'm putting them in the same goddamn like vessel yeah. and I'm like p pushing it out <laughs> yeah. to see like, go, you know, see what happens. You know, Robert Rauschenberg said that, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, ideas are, uh, are not like real estate. You know, you can't put fences up around them and call them yours. You <laughs> yeah. know, because everyone has ideas, and a lot of the time, they, people have the same idea or yeah. very similar ideas. And you know, his his claim was that you know the curiosity was the is the 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 thing that really um, is uniquely individual. Mm -hmm. um, and I like I, that really stuck with me. I, I'm in. Uh, I, and I feel I feel like that about our our shop. You know, it's sure. it belongs to a lot of different people. Um, and you know, one of my favorite things to do and what I, what I get a lot of pleasure from personally is like when you celebrate your friends or you celebrate, you know, the, the people that are doing amazing things around you, um, and like how much that gives back, you know, it's like, it's incredible, you know, um, but the, yeah, there is a, you know, a, a, an element of that um, with what we're trying to do that I, I want to, that's actually something I want to like evolve more, you know, sure. it's like, how do we, how do we use Pilgrim to like kind of present people better, you know, yeah. or, you know, people or, or people's, you know, brands, you know, whatever mm. they may be. Um, how do you, how do you do that more effectively? And I'm, you know, we're, we've got some ideas yeah. for next year, this coming year, like cool. how, how we're going to do that. But how has your experience been in New York in general? Have... In New York? Yeah. I mean, I think New York is like a, you know, it's just like living, breathing thing that, uh, is uh, you can't really. I, I, it's it's amazing. Like I, I I've been here for 16 years and I'm almost 16 years, and I don't know if I could live anywhere else. You know, it's uh, it's one of those places that. Um, I mean, there's I don't even there's nothing like it really. Yeah. I mean, everything comes through here. It's like a big filter. We're almost like our own country, <laughs> you know. And um, it's. Uh, I mean, Brooklyn, like just watching what's happened to Williamsburg, you know, it's, it's, it's insane. You know, it's, you know, people love to, love to hate on it, but um, at the same time, you know, I don't like to glorify elements of the past that weren't so nice either. And, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah, we have a Whole Foods, yeah, we have an Apple store and, you know, um, uh, more convenience and um, access to things, but uh, there's still like a, like the soul that is intact, um, yeah. you know, but, um, you know, I, I, what I love about New York, and especially like what's interesting to see about surfing, is that it's a different, totally different demographic of human being uh, mm -hmm. that you know surfs from where like where you know I grew up surfing. You know, it's uh, um, and people don't wear it on their sleeve. People don't care to like really be known yeah. as a surfer. Yeah. But you know, you have people from like David Zwerner and his son Lucas and um, you know, Cynthia Rowley and uh, Lisa Spellman and. Uh, Julie Gilhard and John Slattery. Yeah. I mean, you have like Adam Lindemann, like you have like these high profile people who are like, you know, doing incredible things in the world, you know, with their, with their lives and their careers, their galleries, their, their artwork, uh, um, but, they, but they surf. Yeah. And they started surfing way later in life, you know, most of them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by that. You know, I've talked about it quite a bit with people. Um, and I think there's like a, the, the, the humility that surfing kind of presents, uh, the challenge and the struggle that you have to actually go through to, to experience like 10 seconds of bliss. Yeah. Uh, I think people like that are just, they're like, they're up for it. They're yeah. like, yeah, I know what this is, you know, I know that I know what struggle is, mm. and I like struggle because I know yeah. what struggle, like what, what what if you if you actually really work through the struggle, what what you get, yeah. and it's that not something that you know you can't go and buy, yeah. And um, I I I think that's really inspiring. It's a, I think what you know inspires Pilgrim as an entity, you know, Definitely. day to day. I'm glad you brought that up because you earlier mentioned sort of what surfing can be seen as at its worst. 
but at its best, it's seen as a hum, sort of a humble adventure. I mean, it's funny too. It's like I, you know, I get around some Hawaiian friends that I know. Or like, you know, they'll they'll come here, or like I'll, I'll see them surfing somewhere, and uh, you know, it's like that they've been surfing their whole life. You know, they're like, you know, they have they have gills, and. Uh, then you have like the friend who started surfing like five years ago here and they're just so geeked out on equipment and like, oh, I got to have this and I got to have that and I got to have it this way and that way and this resin tint like my, my wax job and never have wax on the bottom of my board. Like make sure I've got the perfect, you know, amount of wax on my board and I've got the best wetsuit. I got this, I got that. And they're just like, you know, dialed into this, uh, you know, the equipment, you know, and like what goes into like getting out in the water and, that, and that's so important to them. And then you get like the Hawaiian friend who like spent surfing all their life and they come over and the waves are like you know, good good for us to like head high surf or whatever and they're like oh yeah look at this one oh this board's sick yeah cool let's go you know and it's like grab whatever board yeah. you know don't ask questions don't even look at how long it is don't know the like don't look at the wax the wax might be like melted off the board yeah. no leash whatever boom out in the water and like boom, surfing beautifully yeah. you know and then the other person's like got their thing, it's all dialed in, they go out, and you know, they're having a, 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 an amazing time too, but it's like, yeah. you know, it's just so interesting to see like, um, you know, how many different ways people can kind of come at it. It's, there's no formula for it, you know, there's no like right or wrong way to be a surfer. Right. It's such a personal experience, you know. Um, some people's ambition is to like get pitted and get, you know, get, get the deepest barrel or hit the lip really hard. Mm. Um, and other people's ambition is to just like, go down the line, yeah. you know, and yeah. those are all valid, and um, it's, uh, in, in all judgment aside, there's not, there's not a one right way to, to experience riding a wave. Right. Yeah. Right. Can you talk more about the, um, the connection to Japan, or, or why, why do you think it, why do you think the brand or the, the story resonates in that culture? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, you know, it, it really caught me off guard, honestly, when, um, we first opened, I think it was the first winter that there was a big trade show, you know, men's trade show in, uh, in New York. And we started having these like, you know, visits of like teams of, you know, Japanese buyers that were coming in. It was, and we're having like uh, Mexican standoffs in the shop where mm. like you'd have one team come in and like and another competitor would come in and they would kind of look at each other like, oh shit. And then one team would kind of work their way around the shop and then out the door and, and the other team would kind of make their way in and then another team would come in and it would be like this revolt. It was really wild and we didn't know what was going on. We were like, oh, whoa, what is happening? Where, where are these people from? You know? And I think we just struck a nerve. Um, you know, I think also it was like right place at the right time. And, you know, Brooklyn, you know, um, North Brooklyn, especially, you know, Williamsburg, Greenpoint, Bushwick zone, uh, you know, five years ago was just on fire. Um, and, um, you know, thanks to people like Andrew Tarlow and Seb Stewart and Alyssa, uh, Jill, and all these, all these people that have like done all these amazing things in our, in our neighborhood with, restaurants and bars and um, you know they're all friends and they, you know, they're big influences on us and so we when we opened our store up we we didn't when we opened Pilgrim up we didn't know like if it was going to work you know I mean I was like finally at a place where I'm like well let's you know surf brands and surf apparel really don't like make sense to the people that I know it's mm. just it's not relatable so like but but brands like Norse Projects are and like you know Patagonia and like uh, some of these other um, you know, brands that we, uh, that are partners with, uh, you know, that we're partners with, uh, those things made a lot of sense. So we're like, well, let's put all this stuff together and see, see what happens. I think it might work, you know. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, the Japanese came in and they saw that and I think maybe it was like the first time they saw those elements in the same place and they saw our environment, maybe, that, and they, they got excited. And there's certainly like, a certain aspect of the Japanese um, retail world that is very trend focused, mm -hmm. first to the party kind of a mentality, uh, but they are the best, in my opinion, retailers in, in the world mm -hmm. um, and are also very progressive about men's, especially men's fashion, like uh, a way, the ways that, that, you know, things incorporate into one another. Mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, luckily for us, like, you know, we were starting to make our own clothing. Uh, we were doing that in the garment district. It yep. was really challenging, really hard to make small numbers of things pretty much anywhere. But 
in the garment district, you were definitely like kicked to the side, you know, yeah. like other people, you know, oh, big you, orders. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like making 40 of something. I mean, people are like, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll do that when we have time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were, yeah, we were not. And we'll, we'll give it to like, you know, our uh, intern to sew for right. you. You know, you're like, oh no, you know, right. it was tough. Um, so, and we didn't know what we were doing. To be totally honest, we had no fucking clue what we were doing. Um, we had, you know, a designer that knew what she was doing, and, um, but we did not have, you know, a production team. Yeah. Um, and we were, we were like fighting our way through it. I mean, my grandmother was a seamstress. I grew up around the sewing machine and sewing table and like patterns, and I knew the process, but I had no idea how complex yeah. it was truly to get something you know, made well. Chris and his team at Pilgrim now have three stores with locations in Brooklyn, Amagansett, and Tokyo. An artist at heart, Chris has also been hard at work on a film he put together with musicians under the Greenpoint record label Mexican Summer, a production that called for a dreamlike surf adventure to remote locations across the map. I've dabbled with making like experimental films, you know, but I've never made like a feature length film and I've mm. never directed people. Um, and uh, I had this opportunity to work on a film project with some friends that I met at Mexican Summer, um, at the record label, oh, yeah. they're based out of Greenpoint. Um, Keith and I have become, you know, close friends. He's a, he's a great human being. Um, Andrea Santa Domingo is the, well, one of the owners um, as well. Like these guys are surfers and um, and they have a, a whole archive, you know, um, uh, label that's aside from Mexican Summer that has re-released some of the best surf film soundtracks, um, you know, um, Morning of the Earth, um, Sea of Joy, Evolution, uh, Bali High. Nice. Um, what am I? What am I forgetting? Um, that they, but they're and they're they're continuing to do it. It's pretty incredible. Um, and they tried to make a film, or they were trying to make, you know, like a, like a surf film with a soundtrack, and, and they, they think they tried it, and it just didn't, it, it didn't gel right um, the first time around. And then uh, that was right around the time that Keith and I had met. And um, then he and I started talking about it. And there, there's been films in the past where music has been made for the, there's been a score made for the film. Mm -hmm. But my idea was, if the band members surf, why not do this thing where you take this journey with a luminary group of surfers and that band to like a remote place on the planet and, and everybody surfs and the band is just immersed in the, in the adventure um, and so are the filmmakers and everybody else. Uh, and when they get back to their home turf, they go right into the recording studio immediately and they write, rehearse and record music based on the influence from the experience that they then hand to us, the filmmakers, that we have to edit to. We have to edit that, that moment to. So, you know, it's a, it's a complete, like, uh, you know, everything is kind of interdependent on one yeah. another. Like, there's no, like, everything's kind of given equal weight in terms of importance, you know. So, um, the filmmaking, you know, the cinematography, the, the music, the surfing, the production of, like, getting to these places and getting around, like, all of it has, like, Where was it? equal weight. Uh, we shot in um, mainland Mexico, central mainland Mexico, uh, Iceland, and the, uh, the Maldives. Cool. So the idea, too, was like the three major oceans, yeah. you know, the Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian Oceans. Um, and those guys loved it. They loved the idea. You know, it's not like we had the shot list and we knew exactly what the scenes were, and the editing is like, you know, basically just grabbing those, those things and plugging them in and refining the transitions. Yeah. It's like, we've, we're like we, we have to spend a lot of time in, like feeling our way through the song and the footage. And right. uh, it's, it's been a trip. Yeah. And, um, it's been really fun. Um, it, the whole thing has been a, a joy. I mean, it's work, but right. it's, but it's uh, incredible. And we're hoping that that's going to um, release in, uh, uh, it, it'll, well, it will, it will, it will, it will, will, um, do this like a, a proper um, premiere and release of it in the spring. Going to uh, hard boiled was uh, so I could get in shape <laughs> to be able to like you know surf 
decently for, you know, in, in the Maldives, like in between <laughs> like shooting, you know, yeah. like I wanted to make sure I was good, you know, get, I don't, I just certainly don't get many chances to go halfway around the world to that surf and, like a you know, this tiny little atoll. So, uh, it was, that's how yeah. that started, but yeah. That sounds like a dream. It was. <laughs> yeah. And the music, um, we were on that trip with, um, this incredible guy, Aaron Coys, um, he and his wife have a band called Peking Lights. Mm -hmm. And we're also like pairing, you know, my role was to try to pair the bands with like surfers, the people, personalities that I would think that would gel. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we're so lucky that that really worked well. Like yeah. people became friends, but Aaron was on the trip with us in the Maldives and, um, and you know, we've been editing to his, his music and I mean, it's insane how I mean, all of it, like every band, um, every group, um, All Allahs are in Mexico. Um, Conan Moccasin and Andrew Van Weigarden came to Iceland. Yeah. It's amazing to me, like how sensitive all of those musicians are, like insanely sensitive human beings. They, like the music they made, it's like, it's haunting. It freaks me out because it's like, it's, it's so in tune with the way it felt, it almost amplifies like the, the, the footage, you know, like yeah. actually, it's like the difference between seeing an apple pie and like seeing an apple pie and smelling the apple pie. Right, right. And then you get to taste it, you know? It's like, it's intense, yeah. it's so special. And I, I, um, I didn't see that coming. And um, yeah, it's been, it's been a huge uh, inspiration to me. Do you have uh, any advice for somebody who's just on the cusp of metaphorically starting their own surf shop? <laughs> Don't do it. No. <laughs> um, uh, man, I, she's the advice for them. Uh, I, I mean, I think the, the only advice I would have is to, uh, you know, just do everything, just, just do everything with a high degree of sincerity and honesty and, um, yeah, I mean, passion is passion. And if somebody, if you have a passion for something and you feel and you believe in it, uh, and you're also, it, I think the I think the advice I would give is to be be awake um, and be um, be as flexible and as plastic as you can be. Yeah. Um, even with your with your with your your passion and your goals in mind, yeah. like be prepared to kind of let those things open up a little bit um, and not be so rigid. Yeah. So that you can so that you can make it work. Yeah. You know. Um, That's uh, great. I've. I've gone through that, you know. Yeah. I mean, you can talk to you could talk to these guys about me and my personality and like my management style. And um, I'm, I know I never had to manage people before. I mean, being an artist, you're just in your your studio by yourself, kind yeah. of battling yourself, you know. And um, and I love people. I'm a social human being, but you don't have to. I've never had to manage people. And um, what I'm what I'm focusing on for myself, what I'm trying to work on, is my own emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. Like that's what like that's what like my my goal is. This like right now, it's like a big part of like what I'm trying to be better at is yeah. uh, just kind of understanding my emotions and understanding how they affect other people mm -hmm. and understanding how to you know uh, how to really be empathetic to everything around me. Try to understand everything else's point of view before yeah. I jump to a conclusion. And, and that's really, that's really helping me be a better um, business person, be a better boss, be a better father, be a better husband, I hope, um, all those things. Um, and I think when you're a small business or you're a young, ambitious person, that ambition can really easily turn into fear because you know, of the things that you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a slippery slope. And that's this thing where I see, like, there's nothing worse than a 20, cynical 25-year-old in New York. Like, that's brutal. Like, nobody wants to be around you. <laughs> nobody. Like, and, and everyone will run away. But if you're, like, the 25-year-old that's asking a million questions with a smile on your fucking face, like, you're going to go any way you want. Yeah. You know? Um, and I think that's the, uh, that's, that's a piece of advice. That's great advice. Like, try, to, try to shake that shit off. Because it's easy to go there. Yeah. It's easy to get beaten down by this place. Um, it's easy to be beaten down when you step out of the comfort of you know, a nine to five job and a right. salary and a whatever it is that you have and try to do something on your own um, with your own resources um, and you're asking other people for their help. Right. Um, if you're that person with a big smile on your face asking a lot of questions, there's a lot more people that are gonna be willing to help you. Yeah.